Today we run through some of the latest charts containing the RBA's monthly chart pack, which was released in early April 2018. Roger, this is for you. Hello again, I'm Martin North, the Principal Analyst at Digital Finance Analytics. The latest RBA chart pack is out and we walk through some of the more interesting slides. I'll put a link to the complete set of the RBA series in the section below. Our first chart is of the headline inflation in advanced economies, where we see that inflation is still sitting below the typical target band of 2-3% in the USA, the Euro area and Japan. However, in two of the most populous countries, China and India, inflation is higher, with India close to 5% from a high of 17% in 2010. Inflation in Australia is still sitting below the 2% lower bound of the RBA's 2-3% target range on both the trimmed mean, their preferred measure, and weighted mean basis. Now to GDP. World GDP growth is sitting at around 4% based on purchasing power weighted figures of around 85% of world GDP. We could have a separate discussion about whether GDP is a good or adequate measure of growth, but in short, whilst it might work for a manufacturing based economy, it really does not do the job in more advanced and globalised economies, at least in my view. Anyhow, in comparison, Australian GDP looks pretty poor and fell towards 2% in the last quarter, but looking at the contributions to GDP growth, household consumption made the strongest contribution, with non-mining investment and public demand also helping, but dwelling investment and mining investment both fell below zero. Imports also had a negative impact, as you'd expect. So the RBA is still over-reliant on the household sector performing, which in my view, is a problem. This next chart is very relevant. Household consumption is still higher than disposable income, and the gap is being filled by the falling savings ratio. So we're still spending, but raiding our savings to do so, which of course is not sustainable. Now, the other route to fund consumption is debt. So there should be no surprise to see that total household debt rose again, and note, this is adjusted thanks to changes in the ABS data relating to superannuation. We had previously preached the 200% mark. But on the same chart, we see home prices are now falling. Already the biggest fall since the GFC in 2007. And it's worth noting that the ratio of total debt to GDP is also very high and back up to the pre-GFC levels. Debt is a critical factor in the equation, and we have too much of it in the system, as our banking system expanded to fill the never-ending demand. As a result, although the debts, liabilities, are sky high, total net wealth has stopped growing, and the value of dwellings has slipped a little. This will be an important chart to watch in the months ahead. Note that financial assets, including shares and other types of savings, remain at a high. But of course, those with high debts tend to be the ones with little or no savings, so this chart does not parse out the segmental differences. I think I may need to make a separate video on this issue down the track. Now this chart shows the average trajectory of home price growth across the country. Clearly, rates of growth are tumbling, and so we would expect the indicator to turn negative soon. Some smaller markets like Adelaide and Hobart are helping to support the figures. Of course, the bigger markets like Sydney are already negative. The next chart shows the slight rise in unemployment and the fact that underemployment is still sitting above 8%. So while the government talks up the creation of more than 400,000 jobs recently, the truth is there are many more who want to work. And of course, many of those jobs created are part-time or low paid or even gig economy jobs. The underemployment number belies the apparent low unemployment figures, which other less official sources suggest is nearer to 9%. It's a matter of definition, and certainly the ABS data flatters the true state of play in my book. And to round out our quick tour, we look at housing lending rates. Whilst there has been no recent changes to the cash rate for the past 20 months or so, and bank headline indicator rates for new owner-occupied loans have come down, reflecting strong competition for low-risk new business, the real rates paid by borrowers continue to rise, 
and even small rises will put more into mortgage stress. 965,000 households are in this condition based on our latest research, which equates to about 30% of the market. And you can watch our separate video on this important topic. And expect more rate rises irrespective of what the RBA may do. Here is the US corporate bond yields, which are rising now in response to the Fed's reversal of QE and their lifts of the benchmark rates. And more to come, the latest from the Fed today suggested that at least three more rate hikes in the next year or so, which is faster than many were expecting. And inflation is expected to run hot in the US in the months ahead. Spreads between the Australian 10-year bond yield and the cash rate are rising, all of which is putting more funding pressure on the banks. And we can see that financial companies have been the largest issuer of bonds with significant rises in recent times, and about half of all the bonds from the finance sector are issued abroad. So changes in global interest rates will translate to higher funding costs here. So expect more mortgage repricing upwards. These bond issues, of course, enable the banks to lend ever more, and so create more deposits to inflate the economy and their books. And you can watch our recent video on this, as well as read the article published today in The Australian under my byline. So you can see the current finance system in action. So standing back, we see all the signs of issues ahead with household debt still rising, household consumption relying on debt and savings, and overall growth still over-reliant on the poor old household sector. We need a proper plan B, where investment is channeled into productive growth investments, not just more housing loans. Yet regulators and the government appear to rely on this sector to make the numbers work, but it is, in my view, lipstick on a pig. If you liked what you saw here today, please do like the post and leave a comment. If you've already subscribed, thanks, I really appreciate your support. And if you have not yet done so, please do subscribe to get alerts to new posts. I'm Martin North, the Principal of Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and see you next time.